Uh, officially, hello and uh, welcome to today's program, our Global Connections, as the World Affairs Council of Greater Houston hosts conversation with Frank Mount. I'm Sandy Bayou, Chief Development Officer here at the World Affairs Council. It's our hope that you, your families are doing well. Before we go ahead and head on with our presentation and discussion today, just a reminder uh, to the best way for us to submit your questions is if you move your mouse, uh, you'll see a Q&A tab come up on the bottom of the screen. Uh, if you send your questions through the Q&A tab, I'll be able to see them and uh, weave them in the conversation as we proceed or if it fits best at the end of the dialogue. Again, thank you one more time for being here. And certainly you will agree that now more than ever, it is important to stay informed about what is happening, not in our the city, but all around the world. And our council, World Affairs Council of Greater Houston, brings foreign affairs experts right in the comfort of your home. And Frank Mount is one of them. Frank, welcome. Thanks, Sandia. It's, uh, it's my pleasure to be here. And uh, I wanna say hello to everybody who's on the line and hope you and your families are staying safe and healthy during this tough time. Um, you know, as Sandia said today, in Houston uh, is a beautiful day. The weather is about as good as it gets, and I hope people are getting outside and, and enjoying the weather and, uh, and being able to do something other than to stay home during this time. So well, glad to be here and look forward to the conversation. And how are you, your family, and your team of Chevron doing in current environment? Everybody's well, thanks for asking. Um, you know, people are adjusting. It's a different world, a different life. But, uh, you know, my family, uh, I have four daughters and, uh, you know, they're all kind of grown uh, and they're different parts of the U.S. and uh, they're adapting. They're, they're, they're learning what life is um, under this uh, COVID times. But they're all, thank God, they're all healthy. That's wonderful. That's really great to hear. Uh, Frank, you have had a really very interesting career path. Uh, if I please uh, could allow for some, some highlights for our participants. Again, these are just some of the highlights. Uh, currently, you are uh, the general manager of uh, mergers and acquisitions for Chevron based here in Houston, a position that you assumed uh, November 2019. So happy anniversary, I guess. It's a year since in that position. You joined Chevron in 93 and have held leadership positions of increasing responsibility in Canada, Kazakhstan, the Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and of course here, United States. Most recently, you were the general manager of business development for Chevron Africa and Latin America exploration and production. Frank, your career with Chevron has certainly taken you around the world. I'm sure there are other countries that not only you worked in, but visited a lot. Any region, country that stands out in your memory? Yeah, so thanks, Sandy. You know, I, I'm, I'm blessed uh, to have had my career with Chevron and to have had the adventure and the experiences for myself and my family. You know, I grew up in a small town in West Virginia and uh, went to school in the Midwest in the U.S. and never got the opportunity as a kid to travel abroad. Um, I was 25 years old, didn't have a passport, never been outside the U.S. And, uh, you know, you roll forward through the assignments and the places that we've been to. Uh, I've now been to 75 countries. Um, I have friends and, and business colleagues all over the world. There's very few places in the world where I feel like I would show up or my family would show up and we wouldn't have someone who we could count on or talk to. Um, you know, I, I think the difference um, and in this time of the elections and the divisiveness in our country, um, people are people all over the world. Uh, people love each other. They care about their families. They want security. And uh, they, they want um, uh, the way of life that energy provides. And, uh, you know, being part of Chevron as I've traveled the world um, ha has been a wonderful experience. My kids, you know, when we first moved overseas, my oldest daughter was three years old. My second daughter was three months old. Um, I had a daughter who was born in Thailand. And then I had a daughter, I was on an assignment back in the States who was born back here, but they've all experienced the world. They're all citizens of the world. They have friends everywhere. Uh, around the world, and they they really uh, they they enjoy the adventure that that becomes uh, being a citizen of the world. And what World Affairs Council is about is about giving people those experiences of what doing business around the world is and the value that creates. And so I, I can't say there's a a place that is uh, 
you know, more unique or more special than others. Uh, we, we've enjoyed living in all the cultures and we've enjoyed all the traveling that's come, come with it. Yeah, that's, that's very well said. And I think preparing your family, uh, the younger generation and being comfortable in any part of the world is really the skill uh, so valuable as the world. We seem to reach the world so much faster than we have ever done. And ultimately we really come to realize that uh, people are people, right? And we care for the same uh, basic needs and wants. So it's really wonderful. The fact that somebody speaks different language is just a language. There's still a, a person behind it. So thank you on that. It's just really part, so if I can just, it's really part of the adventure. Um, and it's the mindset that one brings to living abroad. You know, things will be different as you move around the world. And some people say, why well, doesn't like my home uh, area? But other people see it as the adventure and the challenge and the opportunity to grow and to learn and, and to bring new things. And whether it's a new language or new holidays or new food or new religion, whatever, whatever it is, it's, it's part of the adventure. And I'm really happy to save my children feel that way and, uh, and live there like that. That's wonderful. I don't think I've ever asked you, uh, did Chevron find you or did you find Chevron? How did that happen? Um, I think it was uh, a little bit of both. You know, I was, uh, I graduated college. I was working in Dallas and uh, was looking for what was the next assignment. And uh, at the same time, Chevron was looking for someone that I kind of fit the mold. And that uh, was in 1993, we came together and, uh, you know, the rest is history, as they say. And, you know, two or three years later, we, we went abroad and, and we live, lived abroad for quite a while and, and really learned uh, about the world. Oh, yeah. You just said the magic word, the history, as if you knew what I was going to talk about next. And I think it's very important as we talk about uh, Chevron now and Chevron future. Uh, is really knowing uh, history. And yesterday, preparation for a dialogue, I honestly spent quite a lot of time uh, looking through Chevron's history. And again, it's wonderful. It's more than 100-year-old company. Uh, and I think it'd be most helpful if I can recognize some of those facts that I came across. I found very interesting, and I'm sure for the participant, again, for the bigger picture, uh, might be helpful as well. Um, again, the company has had the long, very robust history, began with a group of explorers and mer merchants established the Pacific Coast Oil Company. That was September of 1879. And of course, since then, the company's name has changed more than once, uh, but it always retained the founder's spirit, grit, innovation, and uh, perseverance. Uh, the earliest predecessor was the Pacific Coast Oil Company, and that was incorporated in 1879, as I said, in San Francisco. Uh, and as we know, that was a result of uh, 1860s, was a time when the prospectors arrived in California, uh, and this time looking for a different type of gold, the black gold, gold or oil. And that's how those, the, the, the spirit of the company starts. 1895, a uh, company initiated its enduring marine history on launching California's first steel tanker. So the, the, the start of the, the vessels also there, um, early 1900s. Uh, to meet the growing market uh, for motor fuels. Of course, a lot of progression. Company became revolutionary new sales, which was the world's first service station. So gas stations as we know it actually gets a lot of credit uh, for Chevron is one of the first. Um, we have also very interesting that in 1916, 1916, uh, Standard became the first company in industry to adopt an eight hour day for all salaried and contract employees. That same year, salaried employees were given two week vacation. Isn't that exactly, I think, what is happening in the world? And let me remind you, this is 1916. So I get a lot of credit uh, for so many companies uh, here in the US and the world, of course, following that lead. Uh, first international discovery, June, 1932, Bahrain. Um, your corporation played a lot of strategic roles, of course, World War II and World War I. After US government gave special priority to build the nation's first synthetic detergent plant in 1945, the company had the solid footing to produce a wide array of industrial chemicals, such as detergents, plastics, and synthetic, synthetic fabrics. Again, one of the firsts. Early 50s, for the first time, the revenues bypassed $1 billion. Again, 50s, $1 billion. 
1977, the company made a major organization change and it formed Chevron USA Inc, merging six domestic oil and gas operations into one. Uh, and this change was driven by the need to establish a nationwide identity and consolidated organization. And the company naturally chose Chevron, a name that had led and first appeared in its production in the 30s and had become its most recognizable mark of identification among consumers during the world. And these are just uh, synopsis of snapshots. I mean, what a story, Frank, honestly. Yeah, I know, Sandy, I, we're really proud of the history. If you, uh, if you spend some time with our CEO, Mike Worth, uh, he always starts with the history. We have a archive center in, uh, outside of our headquarters in California that you can go and visit and walk through. And it's got so many of the pieces of history from you know, the, you know, the bell from the first ship uh, to uh, the desk that one of our CEOs from the 20s had to all the branding and signs and different things. And it's a warehouse and they have uh, historians that are there that will walk you around and explain all these things as part of our history. So our history is really important to us. And, and just two or three things that I'll add to the story you told was we, we, we started back in the 1870s before there were cars, you know, and it was really about whale oil. And then it moved to kerosene that basically was what light, lighted the world. And then when cars came around, you, you came into petroleum, gasoline, and diesel, and those types of things. And I, 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 think, I think the message that comes from that is that Chevron is an energy company. We've provided the energy the world needs to help improve people's lives over time. And as the energy transition is moving into a new phase right now um, with wind and solar and you know, hydrogen and, and those types, Chevron will be part of that transition. Um, you know, we, we will be an energy company that helps people as we move forward. And you know, it's really around the pace of that transition that everybody is discussing. But you know, our job is to provide the energy the world needs that is ever you know, affordable, and, and cleaner every day. And, and that's what we get up to do. We're very proud to provide the energy that powers the world um, and moves things forward. Um, the other thing that's important in there is that Chevron is an amalgamation of so many different people and companies. You know, there are people on our leadership team that have come via Legacy Texaco, Legacy Unical, now Legacy Noble, who Dave you know, Dave, Dave was our uh, man of the year for the World Affairs Council. And, you know, right at the time that we were purchasing Noble because of its talented people and its great assets. And Chevron is, is the success of all those people. And when I look around Chevron, we're better off because we have that diversity. And diversity isn't just, you know, skin color, religion, or sex, but it's, it's thought, it's education, it's experiences. It's all those things that come in as diversity that really help you run a better company and do things better because you, you're getting different ideas and different, uh, uh, you know, a, a different mix and a different challenge and a different uh, thought process. And so those are the things that has evolved over time with Chevron. And I'm one of the most proud that I am of our company is it is really that diversity that comes. Completely agree. So I, I think it was again to, so worth noting is the, the transition, the growth and uh, uh, re-innovation and pivoting when it needs be and always being a leader with so many first initiatives. And I mentioned earlier to you today that uh, I think there's a lot more firsts to come as we hit historically, there's a lot more firsts to come this year, next year, 10 years and hundreds of years. And, you know, uh, no world is no longer just a playground. It's already, you know, reaching the moon and the stars. So I'm no doubt that Chevron will find a way to be part of the, the exploration of uh, above and beyond. I've, we have heard the term uh, Chevron way, and I read it as, as the heart of the Chevron's company is the Chevron way to be the global energy company most admired for its people, partnership, and performance, similar to what you just said. Uh, in, in your words, what is Chevron way? Yeah, you know, I mean, there's so many simple ways to think about it. It is, you know, do things the right way every time, do things the way that if the press was standing watching you that you'd want the press to report. It is, it is, it is what forms who we are all around the world. And, you know, when you go back to my bio, Sandia, and you talk about the places in the world that I've done business, 
And every one of those places has a different rule of law. Everyone has a different uh, way of treating people or, but, but in all those places, Chevron behaves the same way. You respond to a situation, you view uh, what's right and what's wrong. You, you bring ingenuity, you, you do the things uh, the same way. Um, and it's, it's really the foundation of uh, the Chevron way brings to us. It is, you know, the first day you walk into the company, it's what we talk about. It is, it is how we, 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 we behave in every country we do business in. And it forms foundation of partnerships when, when governments or partners or suppliers deal with Chevron, they understand that if they're dealing with Frank Mount, he's gonna behave one way. If they're dealing with person X, Y, Z, they're gonna, they're gonna behave the same way uh, because the foundation is Chevron. And, and you know, the more that you, you bring that to bear, um, the more people understand that that's what they're going to get as they deal with Chevron and they have a clear expectation and it allows us to be the partner uh, that everybody wants to do business with because they understand consistency in the way we're going to do business. So it's the foundation of who we are and what we do is the best way to think about it. Yeah, that's, that, that's very well said. And I know that Chevron really strives to empower people around the world, as you said, to improve their lives and really meet their full potential. And you have so many initiatives that promote diversity, inclusion, creating prosperity, as you said, respecting human rights uh, in the communities that you operate and you do that so well uh, globally. And I know that community support again is uh, really um, one of the initiatives that Chevron stands behind and it's uh, always perceived as representing the local needs, as I mentioned, again, go back to diversity, a global company reacting locally, supporting employment community and local organization um, and partnerships with groups like us. So we're very proud to be affiliated and so happy uh, to be part of the vision that uh, Chevron has uh, for involvement here in Houston uh, with us. Uh, perhaps some initiatives or community support that stands out to you that I haven't mentioned. Yeah, you know, there's so many. It's it's hard to single them all out, but you know, from, build, from building schools to building hospitals to you know, we a marine naval center we built in Kazakhstan um, to very active in the Houston community there. Um, you know, through multiple the food bank and the zoo and the the, the, the different things we do. There, there's there's too many to to really go through. I, I think it's at the core of who we are. We have to be a partner with the communities where we operate. You know, one, one thing I want to make sure that I, I don't leave out is, you know, we, we're like everybody transitioning through uh, trying to ensure that diversity improves in the world. And, you know, that's gender diversity, that's uh, racial diversity in, in this time. And, you know, in 2016, uh, based on the work we had done at the time, um, we won the Catalyst Award for promoting um, diversity in the workplace. And, you know, we've been a big sponsor of that organization ever since um, in terms of making sure that programs are funded and growth is happening. Um, one program that really stands out is something we call MARC. It's called uh, M-A-R-C, Men Advocating Real Change. And what we, what we really realized, particularly as it related to gender diversity, it's it's one thing um, for you to have a lot of programs and for, for females to really push forward uh, for gender equality, but it's another thing for men to really stand up, get involved and say, this is gonna change under my, uh, under my watch and the legacy when we move on will be something different than what we came into. And so again, Mike, our CEO is extremely passionate around uh, men advocating real change. We've invested a lot of money uh, we have uh, many programs within Chevron where work is, uh, is, is really trying to make a difference and change and create a new legacy. And, uh, you know, it's something that's in addition to the Catalyst Rewards that uh, I'm really proud of. And um, I think as we move forward, it will be something that changes the legacy. Wonderful. Well, I want to talk a little bit about uh, COVID. We can't really uh, ignore it. Um, impact of COVID. Um, how has uh, the virus impacted, you know, your corporation? We know again, employees working home and, and such. Any other in impacts or outcomes or effects? 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's affected everyone. And I again, I want to hope everyone out there is staying safe and their families are safe and they're 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 uh, being able to to deal with the, the world we're living in right now. Um, at Chevron, you know, our corporate offices have been in, in Houston have been uh, closed since March. Um, people are are amazingly working from home and getting things done. Uh, the technology of Zoom and you know Microsoft Teams and WebEx has really allowed uh, us to continue our business. We have people all over the world, though, that, that have to go to the facilities that we work at because they're working in an oil field or they're working in a refinery or they're working on ships that are really helping to create the energy that the world needs. And so, um, you know, we've taken tons and tons of precautions, as you can imagine, um, to, to ensure their safety um, around the world. Um, something in my area, you know, this year we, uh, as we referenced earlier, uh, we were lucky enough to acquire Noble Energy um, and uh, we brought their assets and their people into the company and we're really happy about that. That was done, I would say, 98% virtually. Um, we had lots of meetings, lots of interactions with lawyers, bankers, uh, the company of Noble, the due diligence on, an, on a transaction of that scale um, happened virtually. There were a few meetings that had to happen towards the end, face-to-face uh, -face negotiations. But, but like I said, most of it uh, happened virtually. So the world is adjusting. We're finding ways to do business. Um, but I, I, me, for one, I can't wait to the day that I can go and shake somebody's hand again and not have to do an elbow bump and uh, you know be able to sit across the table and have a beer, or a glass of wine, and a nice meal and, and really get to know people. I, I think it works well in places where you know someone and you know their family and you've already formed a relationship it's very hard when you're meeting someone for the first time to really give them the warmth of um, who you are. And, uh, you know, I've known you luckily for a couple of years now. And so, you know, the person I am, I know the person you are, and we're able to connect through Zoom. But uh, I think we as a world really need to get back to that physical contact, that personal contact. And, uh, I, I completely I, agree with that. I look forward to the day we do that. Yeah. Uh, you just mentioned uh, Noble, and thank you again for uh, mentioning that. And uh, as you said, uh, we celebrated Dave Stover as the International Citizen of the Year and recognizing Noble's accomplishments and how that lined up um, with the, the new REACH goals uh, of Chevron. And uh, that, I think, in a way, created a little bit of a shift, uh, right? You have a, a new opportunities in Egypt, Israel, um, Qatar with this, uh, with Noble's participation with you. Uh, any kind of thoughts on uh, on not just Noble itself, but kind of the direction where the company is going. Yeah, you know, like I said, we are really happy with the assets and people that we acquired as part of buying Noble. Um, you know, my team in mergers and acquisitions looks across the world for opportunities to invest Chevron's capital profitably. And uh, when we started investigating and spending time with Noble, it was clearly an asset that uh, we, we believe we could get value from and um, legacy assets that we'll be proud to own five, 10, 15, 20 years from now. And the people of Noble that we got to know uh, were really good people. And they, many of them have joined Chevron and will be part of our family and will help us create value, not just in the areas where they operate, but in the bigger Chevron uh, business. We're very excited about their whole portfolio. We, we really like their business in uh, Colorado. We like their business in the Permian. We like their business in Eagleford. We like their business in West Africa. Um, and we like their business in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, they were very successful in Explorer and they found lots and lots of gas that they were selling via pipeline into Israel, Jordan, and into Egypt and in places like Israel and Jordan, where there's not natural resource, um, that gas replaces coal, um, and it makes you know it, it, natural gas is a much cleaner source of fuel than coal, so it helps the environment. Um, and uh, you know the government of Israel has been a good partner with Noble. They've so far been a very good partner with Chevron. We look forward to doing business there, and uh, you know it, it, we're very excited about what what the Noble assets bring bring to Chevron. Agree, and uh, sorry to be sticking on that, on uh, reflecting on Israel a little bit, but we have a chance, part of the celebration, actually have remarks by a Minister of Energy for State of Israel, and of course he knew about Chevron 
uh, partnering with Noble and kind of the future. And um, he was beyond thrilled that uh, Chevron will be there and is the new partner for uh, State of Israel and, and the region as well. So it's a wonderful, I mean, they, they did a really good job and, you know, we will continue of bringing together, having energy, bring together cultures. You know, they, they sell Israeli gas, as I said, into Egypt. Mm -hmm. um, they have an Eastern Med for, a forum where they share infrastructure and they have pipelines that link many of the countries together, trying to be efficient with capital and trying to meet the energy needs of the region. Um, they've done a really good job of allowing energy and commerce to bring countries together. Um, and, uh, you know, Noble deserves a lot of credit for being at the forefront of that. And that's one of the reasons, you know, we selected Dave as, uh, as one of our men of the year uh, he, under his leadership that that happened. And, uh, you know, the, peop the, the, the people of Egypt and minister of Egypt, the president of Egypt, you know, the people of Israel and, and, and the like, the president, the prime minister, um, and the same thing in Jordan, they, they all are working together to do what's in the best interest of the environment, the people, and, and to really spur their economies along. And uh, Noble was right in the center of it. And, uh, what a, what a uh, global, uh, globally to follow, I think, for, for many, uh, this Chevron and beyond and others, just that uh, in, on a better, for the better of the humanity and better for the nation, so great. Um, I actually have a question from Alan. Um, this aligns with your line of work, mergers acquisitions. So um, let me read it out. It it's, uh, uh, has quite a few uh, sentences in there. So Chevron has been very aggressive in mergers and acquiring properties. And Adarko and Noble as example, and we just spoke about it. Uh, your capital spending is down by almost 50%. Will your growth model continue along this line of mergers and property purchases? American energy companies have been accused of being slow in developing projects along a more a green line in comparison with Shell BP and other international oil companies. Where does Chevron stand in this area? I know it's a lot. But, uh, yeah, no, no, there's, uh, there's really two themes in there. And so let me see if I can answer them. Um, you know, we take very seriously our role as um, of, of allocating the capital that our shareholders put into the company. You know, we, we, are, the, we, we are an oil company that, that basically has to make investments that will enable us to generate value and return cash to our shareholders. And we take that rule very seriously. Sometimes the best way to do that is through organic investment, through the assets we have in our portfolio and making investments and developing those things so that they generate cash flow that allows us to to return cash to our shareholders and create value for our shareholders. Mm -hmm. Sometimes those are buying somebody else's assets um, uh, because they will generate more value. And so the job inside of Chevron as a capital allocator is to make sure that you're, you're choosing the path that has the least risk and the highest returns and whether that's developing your own resources or buying, buying something else. And we, we evaluate that trade-off every day, all the time. Um, you know, in both the case of the Anadarko transaction, which didn't move forward, um, and the uh, Noble transaction, which did close, there was lots of synergies and lots of opportunities in their asset bases that we, uh, as Chevron, believe would have created a lot of value for our shareholders. On our organic portfolio, you know, we have some of the best assets in the world, and we do fund those uh, with priority. We have a great position in the Permian. We have a really strong position um, in Western Australia uh, with, with a, a gas export facility. We have a really great position in Kazakhstan where we've been blessed to do business with the government of Kazakhstan and for the people of Kazakhstan for a long time. Strong position in the Gulf of Mexico, big position in West Africa. You know, you, you can go through it. And we're really blessed with opportunities. And our job is to be uh, discerning in how we use the capital that our shareholders give us to make the investments that create the most value. So uh, that, that's the way we view M&A. Uh, it has to clear a pretty high bar uh, for us to use capital. On the energy transition question, it goes back to your history of Chevron. You know, we have been part of the energy transition since the 1870s and as things yeah. go And we will continue to do that because our job is to bring, you know, affordable, available, ever cleaner energy to the world. Um, the thing is, you, you, you have to do it in a very prudent way. You have to do it where there are opportunities 
to, um, to, to be a part of the energy transition, but also to make investments with our shareholders' money that create value. Um, you know, some of our European peers, um, I, I would say, have moved very quickly and have leaned very fast to energy transition. And we're not so sure if the investment opportunities are out there really generate the returns that need to be there. So our point of view is that you need to be, you need to, you need to have a balance between transitioning and creating value for your shareholders and bringing in the energy that the world needs. And so you'll see us, you know, on our earnings call that just happened um, last week, we talked a lot about um, our renewable natural gas investments we've recently made. We talked a lot about um, our solar and wind that we're bringing into our operations. They're helping to power um, you know, our existing operations. We talked a lot about our carbon sequestration. You know, it, we're basically at our plants in Western Australia. You take the carbon that comes out of bringing the gas in and then you blow the gas back into underground reservoirs so it doesn't escape to the air. Um, you know, we're making those investments because they're good for the world and we're making those investments because they're, they're value creating for our shareholders. You should, you should believe we will continue to make those, um, but, but they'll have to be balanced in that space. And uh, actually, I kind of thought something aligns to what we just spoke about, kind of a little bit of your history, one of the first, but uh, there was interesting uh, partnership um, that Chevron is uh, part of uh, San Francisco uh, International Airport uh, Landmark Agreement uh, for the use of sustainable aviation fuels, uh, which is a uh, low carbon and sustainably produced alternative to the jet fuel. Uh, An airport is working with a group of, I believe, eight airlines and fuel producers to expand the use of, um, of these type of fuels uh, at the airport. And what is really the first project of its kind that includes fuel suppliers, airlines, airport agencies, and all in an effort to accelerate the global uh, transition to sustainable fuels. And I know the airlines at the airport currently use, at the airport use about 1 billion gallon of jet fuel annually, annually. And the use of this new fuel really could reduce the emissions by nearly 4.8 million metric tons per year. And that's equivalent to uh, emissions of 1 million cars. So I, again, that's a big first. So uh, it's, Congratulations. So again, uh, uh, it's a airline industry is, of course, is a huge global industry, understanding the given climate, but I'm confident things will turn around. And again, Chevron will be already with a concept and not just concept tested, and you can proceed globally with similar initiatives. So congratulations on that as well. Thank you very much. It, it's just another example of, you know, where we will participate in the energy transition. Yeah. Um, you know very well um, as a board member uh, and really uh, individual that salutes what the council does that education is uh, very part of our mission. Uh, and we educate uh, anybody who is interested. And we start from early, as early as middle school to carry through high schools, through universities, colleges, and to the friends of the council that are, want to continue learning. And as I say, we'll honestly learn something every day. So as the preparation for my dialogue with you, uh, some of the students that are part of our Student World Affairs Councils, uh, I had reached out to them and they had sent in some questions for me to ask you. So uh, this question comes from Connor. If you could provide your young self with advice, what would it be? Perhaps some lesson learns, lessons learned, I'm sorry. Yeah, Connor, that's a great question. Um, you know, and it, I think I'm going to answer it from the lens of uh, Frank, who was a you know kid from a small town in West Virginia, who again didn't have a passport until he was 25, and really didn't have the knowledge and experience about what the world's about and temperance and um, you know uh, being balanced and listening to two sides to every equation. And I compare that to my children who have had the experience of living around the world and traveling. And you know, the, the discussions that we have, the openness, the questioning, the, uh, the, the views on either side, uh, I, think, I think they have a much better view of the world. And so my advice to the young Frank would have been to be more open, to be a better listener, to really listen and learn and to read. Um, and, and to be a consumer 
of what the world has to, to bring. The, the world is a fascinating place and it's a great place. And uh, there's, there's so many different ways that things get done. There's not necessarily always a right or wrong. And so I, I, I would ask the youth of America, particularly at this divisive time of, of politics in the US to realize that people are good in, in, in their hearts um, and that there's many ways to, to, to skin things and to be the best listener you can be to be to consider different ways of getting things done and and really trying to bring people together. Wonderful. I also have some other questions coming in from the webinar, uh, but let me go back to Mia. Uh, Mia is another student who says it's kind of your interaction with humans uh, globally. Uh, what are your two, three simplest guidelines of interacting or getting to know someone when you meet them, especially for the first time? That's a great question. It always starts with a smile. And it always starts with a curiosity. Um, you know, living like we did in Kazakhstan, um, you know, no one in Kazakhstan, very few uh, in, I live in a, a city called Almaty. It's a city of two or 3 million people. Um, but it's a, it, it was probably the most, um, uh, the, the least westernized place I'd ever been. No one spoke English. And so you'd go to the grocery store and, and if you didn't speak Russian, um, they didn't know one, two, three, four, five. They didn't know yes or no. And I didn't know that on the Russian side. And so it really started with a smile and a, and a you know, uh, bring out the calculator, type the numbers in. And, it, and then it came with the curiosity to learn, to learn Russian, um, which we did quickly, um, to, to, to understand culture and what people ate and how they dealt with their families. And so, so to me, it's really around having an open mind, being curious, uh, wanting to share, wanting to learn, wanting to listen. Um, and uh, I, I think those are the things that always, always carry the day as you start to meet people. Wonderful. Uh, again, I have other questions coming in. Let me finish with the last uh, question from Jason, one of the students again. How do you find balance in your daily, weekly routine? I know, again, that this is me saying this, the routine has changed uh, from kind of the previous are there some hobbies that uh, kind of keep you intact? Yeah, you know, it, it, it has changed, Sandy, and I think it's really important that everybody um, takes time to themselves. And like I said, in Houston there, I hope they're going to get out this weekend and enjoy the weather. Um, you know, we, we spend a lot of time at work and we give a lot at work and we, we try to create value and, and, and be the best employee or leader you can be. But you also have to take care of yourself. You have to do things that you enjoy. You have to do things with your family. You have to you have to take the time to do that. You know, over the years, you know, I've been really involved in my girls as they've grown up. Um, whether that was their athletics, whether that was their dance, whether that was you know their friends, um, and really trying to be involved. Be involved with your spouse or your partner. Um, make sure you're in, interested in the things that they do. My wife is a librarian, um, and you know. I'll come home and there'll be books all over the place. And, uh, you know, I can't think of a different, uh, a different part of life than what I live every day. Um, but be interested, listen to what she's doing, be a part of that. Find time, as you asked about, about hobbies, whether that's, you know, playing uh, golf or whether that's traveling or whether that's reading a book or whether that's gardening or whether it's exercise, whatever it is for you that really helps you, you know, find time for those things in. And you know the best places to work, like Chevron, realize that and strongly encourage that that balance. And whether that was during the old days of going to work in the office every day, or whether it's now um, at home, we 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 want people to take their vacation. We want people to to be able to. If there's a dog backing working in the background, if their kid needs help, that you need to be a, a human first, and then you can really be a good employee. And so. Thanks for the question. I think it's a good one. Thank you. Not to really talk the conversation, but I had a woodpecker literally knocking right side, side of the tree. So that's the Very reality true. of- You should have turned the camera around so we can see it. <laughs> so, yeah. So I have a question from Jessica. Uh, taking into account what's been said about the consistency with Chevron's relationships with others, how important and what is the value Chevron gives to public relations as a way to interconnect with the world. 
You know, that's really important. Um, you know, we have a whole group of people uh, who work inside of Chevron whose job they could call them public and government affairs people. So they deal with the media, they deal with communities, they deal with the governments in the places we operate. And they, they, they bring people together. They let them see the Chevron culture. They let them understand that we're gonna be a partner and we're gonna be there. And it's working with World Affairs Council, it's working with the zoo, it's working with the food banks, it's working with schools, governments all around the world. And so there's a function that that is their primary role. But every person who works in Chevron has some of that in their role, whether it's myself as an executive or you know, all the way up and down the, 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 the company. It is around making sure that people um, understand that when Chevron comes, we're going to be a partner. We're going to do things the Chevron way. We're going to be part of communities where we operate. And, uh, you know, uh, the, the PGPA, the, the public and government affairs people, they, they, they help very much because they every day know who these people are and, and they, but, but it's really incumbent on all of us to be part of the communities. Thank you. Um, Bob asks, when will Chevron restart geothermal investments, the true continuous clean energy that fits and long-term monetizes Chevron's global land rights? You know, it's a great question. Um, we've, we've had geothermal investments in our portfolio for many, many decades. Um, you know, and for those of you who don't know, geothermal is you use the earth's energy, uh, you know, think, Think uh, Old Faithful in Yellowstone, you know, where, where there's steam or those type of things coming out of the, the ground naturally. Uh, you're able to, to, to capture that in some places and create energy. Um, geothermal investments are, are very interesting. The, the key there is they have to be something that can create value as well. And, you know, we, we look at those, we manage those, we invest in those uh, along the same lines of, you know, we want to provide ever cleaner energy, but it has to be something that generates a return. And so what you need to generate returns is you need the energy source and you need a way to capture it. And then you need a way for people to pay you for it. Um, you know, one of our geothermal investments that we've had for years was in Indonesia. And, you know, that we, we had steam that went into uh, steam turbines that generate electricity. Electricity went to the government. And, and, you know, it really comes down to how can you, th th is, th is that government electricity going to subsidize the amount you have to invest to, to generate it. And, and where there are those opportunities, we will be an active participant um, in that investment. Wonderful. And um, uh, for other participants, this is kind of your last chance really to, uh, you know, send a, a last question or two. If you have something is on your mind, uh, go ahead and, um, you know, to send it my way. Uh, Frank, as we, Go to the conclusion of our discussion. Is there anything you think that uh, we should have touched upon or uh, perhaps I didn't think about asking? Sandia, as always, you were very thorough in your prep work. Um, I think your story of the Chevron history was outstanding. Uh, I'm really proud to be from Chevron. I'm proud um, of what it represents to the world. Um, I'm proud of the people I work with. They care, they uh, want to make the world a better place. I'm really proud to be associated with the World Affairs Council. Thank you. Um, you know, serving on the board is something I, I enjoy. And uh, the work that you guys do to help educate the young and bring government leaders and business leaders together um, is critical. It's critical for, for, for moving us forward to a place where we're more collaborative, where people understand each other better, and we can create a better world for all of us to live in. And so I think yourself and Marianne and, and the people of the council do a really, really good job of that. And you've done a really good job during such a difficult time of COVID, of keeping programming going, of keeping people engaged and keeping the education um, initiatives that you do. So I, I wanna thank you guys uh, for all you do and, uh, and really thank everyone for listening and having an interest in me and Chevron. Wonderful. I think we have a really fantastic weekend. Uh, we got everybody encouraged to go outside, uh, enjoy this beautiful fall weather, fall colors as you see them. <laughs> uh, this is the time to take in the coloring, the families, the walks, dogs, birds, and, and you name it. Um, again, uh, thank you everybody for your interest.
Frank, thank you for your time. We're grateful partners to push Chevron. And for our participants, thank you for your time again. We know that there are other things you could be doing and you chose us. So we're extremely grateful uh, for the opportunity. Wishing everybody a good weekend. And with this concludes our today's discussion. Thank you much. Have a good weekend, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bye-bye.